Anyway, so th thank you for joining me here on the last day of the conference, especially since we had a, hopefully you had a good time last night. Um, I will talk to you about the metaverse beyond the buzzword, and the, the title is um, pretty broad, and um, I, full disclaimer, I was adjusting the talk a little bit, um, and you will si see why um, in a second. So briefly about me, I already dabbled with virtual reality technologies in the 1990s, but I'm by no way the deep expert in all things because there was no money in it, and so I worked in enterprise backgrounds for many years. So um, my name is Andreas Urban, and I'm affiliated with a company called Daynet. The company is in Germany, not part of a larger company called RCP, but I live in the United States. I do give some public presentations. That's why I also have those MVP and regional director things um, as uh, recognitions. But um, sometimes I'm still as stupid as I always was. And um, my goal has been to adopt new technologies, basically. So virtual reality, mixed reality, applied artificial intelligence. So this is a little bit, so I want to start this almost controversial. Are we right now in the trough of disillusionment? So if may, you may have heard that Microsoft has layoffs last week and Metaverse was affected to some degree. And my, so this is basically um, a, like image, trans, uh, image generation where the so fancy HoloLens devices now transform finally into a blindfold. And um, so as you may have heard of the, of, of the hype cycle, often it gets overhyped and then you go through a trough of disillusionment and hopefully to a plateau of productivity. I think for mixed reality, metaverses may be a little bit more waves than that. And my goal is today not to so much criticize whatever Microsoft has been doing in terms of layoffs or strategy changes, but still try to give a, a path forward of what could be relevant in my opinion. Yeah, this is another approach of it. It's like the funny Mr. Bean or whatever um, has a fever dream. Didn't work as well as my own face. Um, so I wanted to start um, to somewhat level set to or to think about a few things that we found when we started working in this third dimension. We had a, an artist designer, a mascot for, at that time, a startup adventure we tried to pursue as a spin-off of the main company. And the goal was to have a cute mascot that looks like Zootopia and helps you to guide through experiences and also to be our branding, basically. And so the artist at one point gave us a 3D model and we put it in 3D for the first time, but then a few th weird things happened. This is not that version, but I'm just gonna show you the, the final version behind the scenes so, so you know what we're talking about. Um, and I'm sorry that the video is choppy. It basically follows you around as you move. I'm gonna skip forward a little bit. So when we walk, it hops and follows your footsteps basically. And uh, it has a function of finding Easter eggs. Um, there are Easter eggs hidden in that room and um, we could give it a command like, hey, guide us to the next Easter egg, with the goal being that you find the Easter eggs as a human and then over time explore more and more of the space and get a better mapping of that environment. But the key thing of this, what we found when we first saw that kangaroo in 3D in front of us, not this final version, we were like, something is wrong, something felt off. Yeah? So something triggered in our brain and we analyzed it and what we found is that um, that animal had claws. So if you have a, like a five foot five or one meter 65, one meter 70 kangaroo standing in front of you with the bulky body in your real 3D space and has claws, something triggers in your brain. Like some people get triggered when they see a spider or a snake. So um, we went back to that artist and basically had them, the artist remove the claws and things went better. The artist was really hurt, but it taught us something. That the lecture from that is if we go into 3D space, we're literally invading somebody's 3D space and we need to be a little bit more careful about designing experiences. But let's go be back even further. Um, so our computing history is not that recent and, and not that old in terms of a um, bigger picture of um, our history of our human nature, right? So the Babbage difference and then in 1946, is how, would you do, how would you develop Software. You would change plugging through of cables. That's how you change the program of a computer. And then later on, you have the punch cards. That was already a big change. You could on the fly change program of a computer. The integrated terminal came where you could type something and the computer would react. You would interact with the computer like with a typewriter almost. And then 
1963, the mouse was invented. 1968, we saw the first integrated terminal with a, some resemblance of the windowed um, user interface. So this is like 50, almost 55 years old now. So, so this is how old the technologies are that define much of our today's workflow for most people. You might think it's touch screen or we have touch now. Well, touch screen was also invented in 1965. And um, well, the first mobile phones with apps, the Simon, was uh, in the 1992, 1994 time frame. So, but what changed? Smaller pixels, bigger pixels, brighter pixels, faster computer, um, slightly different form factors. But fundamentally, we need to learn to interact with those systems, to interact with a two-dimensional interface, and learn specific commands. Yeah, that's basically what it's all about. The question is, is there a next wave of computing? When you say, OK, we have personal computing, then we have the web, the mobile and cloud, and what could this next generation of computing be? And there are, of course, a lot of people who have different answers, like there's, oh, it's Web3, or it's artificial intelligence, and there are um, different ways to think about that. But in this context here, um, I'm trying to think of it like we're jumping in the third dimension. Uh, with some, jumping in the third dimension, we are trying to interact with three-dimensional space and understanding three-dimensional space. So let's, this is, um, let's look at the metaverse briefly. Where does the terminology even come from? It comes from a book called Snow Crash. But um, let's forget about the book for a second and let's look at when did people talk, start talking about it. Yeah, this is Google Trends. And Google Trends, um, let's say the last, let's say 2004. You see some blips here uh, from January 2021. Can we zoom into that a little bit better? The last, can we do the last, uh, let's say 2020. Come on. Hmm? Oh, what did I do wrong? Uh, the other way around there. Yeah. Uh, apologies. So you saw basically here in, um, there was in, in 2021, there was a blip around April. That is when Microsoft mentioned it in the keynote at Ignite. And um, Alex Kipman had the keynote of the Ignite conference, of the Enterprise conference, um, delivered in Allspace VR. That's now discontinued um, going forward. But, um, and so Microsoft made a commitment into that. But, and then there's another blip here. I think NVIDIA mentioned it at a conference. And then this larger blip is when Meta, um, Facebook, suddenly decided they're going to rename themselves. Ever since, we, ever since we have some level of static noise and everybody talks about the metaverse, yeah, to some extent. So the problem is there are too many definitions. Like there, everybody has a slightly understanding to it, but if you go through it, like there are some patterns are has something to do with 3D worlds and interactive and integrated and maybe cross-world experiences and so on. But the problem is that the industry hasn't really found an agreement what it all means yet. The Gartner definition is relatively um, encompassing, like say it covers a lot. So it's a virtual space and the convergence of physical and digital realities, so also trying to interact or understand the real world. And um, they make the point it shouldn't be just a single vendor, so that we need to have something that may be vendor, uh, cross-vendor functionality. And then they bring in this uh, virtual economy, NFTs, digital currency topic, meaning crypto. Yeah? So that's how at least the most influential um, analyst company of the world sees it. And, um, but in reality, every company now says metaverse. They're renaming their game, their games, 3D game, this is metaverse now. Or they're saying, oh, our industrial internet of things automation is metaverse now. Um, we'll try to get. A, we'll try to show a few examples of why that is and so on. Um, here's a bunch of use cases. These use cases are very similar to what you also find in virtual reality: simulations, optimization of spaces, engaging a brand, virtual concepts, uh, any types of meetings or, or learning and so on. So that's all not like really brand new in that sense. What use cases could be. And um, this is from Microsoft, um, tries to mostly focus on 
discrete worlds and business to business, business to customers, and some gameplay, custom experiences, and uh, yeah, any type of immersive spaces. And this is more on the, the industrial side of things, um, like um, to have better decision making, to have better simulation. So here's the IoT connection with IoT, digital twins, artificial intelligence, and so on. Automation and remotely controlling real world objects. But let's look at a few example use cases at like smaller companies like ours um, implemented, for example, for training. This is um, on a HoloLens device where you would visualize a stenting procedure. The advantage being um, stenting like to expand an artery, fix the blockage. And um, it's a little uh, sped up. Um, the advantage of this would be that in a good metaverse application, multiple people would, might be able to say this, see the same things and point with their finger, like the, depending on the device, on the virtual object, and they would be able to talk about the virtual object as if it would be in real life there. And maybe you would also have remote participants with avatars and so on. So the idea is to make things visible that would, would be un, otherwise un, in, invisible and to collaborate better on, on them. Customers for that could be a lot, could be patient education, um, the, those device makers of the stents, those little piece of metal cost thousands of pounds of dollars, and so they sometimes have an interest to show why are they better if it is just how they fold. And, um, and overall, education is a, is, a, is a big sector where a lot of people see advantages in this technology. So now the digital twin scenario, this is also very hands-on. This is basically, um, the challenge was we had a... Um, a case of an industrial barcode reader. They all look the same, um, but the, the bits inside are different. So there's, for example, that scanning field. How, so, and because they didn't have any external markers, they didn't want any markers, no, so we couldn't, for example, attach a barcode. So we needed to have some type of system to lock the position into the space. And so we aligned the virtual representation over the real object, then made the virtual object invisible, and were able then to show telemetry. For example, the scanning field, which otherwise would be invisible, so a company can say, hey, it helps you to plan, and they can also help why they are better. And you can show what we're scanning, what the configuration, the IP address, the temperature, all sorts of telemetry and data that you otherwise couldn't see in the location where it would matter. Yeah? So this is the, the overarching concept then would lead into a digital twins, Internet of Things, industrial metaverse. Industrial metaverse is in a way, just a way to think about industrial type of data that may be exposed in the metaverse. In the most simple case, it could be a configuration file for a robot where you know the location of, and maybe you store that, and maybe you can visualize it. But some people think of it metaverse so abstractly that you don't need to have a fancy visual behind it. For example, in internet, in IoT Hub in Azure, the configuration file of that little um, configuration of the, those um, modules you run on an IoT device are also called digital twin. Yeah, it's just a JSON file. Yeah, so not nothing. But in our case, we like to think of a digital twin still having some 3D representation. So, but again, I take a step back, and this goes back into this whole mixed reality, extended reality. Um, field is what are the building blocks of so applications I've been built on? And I don't have time to go into the code or the examples how to do that, but for example, what is gaze? Gaze is more than the mouse pointer. Gaze could be, as, however, as simple as the app knowing what you're looking at. And looking at could mean that you wear a headset and think of it like in a virtual laser pointer, but it just represents the head direction. Or it could be a little bit more advanced, like Oculus 2 headsets, for example, or HoloLens 2, they have eye tracking. So they could actually, if you enable it, see or get an idea what you're looking at and respond to that. What can you do with that? Of course, you could do user interaction. Like I look at, at this glass here, and, and it would be virtual, make it twice as large, yeah? so then they could react to the command. Or it could also be trying to learn. Um, there's a um, a mixed reality demo application that in, in, in the US, Lowe's is a big home store where you buy, buy kitchens and screws and also on. They had a kitchen configuration tool. And what they did, I don't, um, in that research or internal um, project, like incubation project, they built a heat map of what people were looking at for how long and what were they talking about. So for example, oh, I, I let's go home, let's order the kitchen. And then maybe the sales associate would say, oh, 
Actually, your eyes lingered on this, those knobs for a while, um, and you were saying like cold, metallic, didn't like. So maybe this is the one thing you could improve. So the, the key is when you interact with three-dimensional space and get some insights into it, privacy, of course, you have to think about that, you can enable completely new scenarios based on that you interact in the third dimension. Gestures could be as long as these, these, these artificial gestures. This is so-called AirTap. AirTap was invented by Microsoft um, for the reason that it, in most cultures, it's not something you naturally do, so you can distinguish it from naturally speaking. Um, sorry, Italians, but, um, <laughs> but, um, the, um, um, but it could be between anything like trying to understand what I'm, that I'm naturally reaching out and grabbing an object, a virtual object or, or a real object, to a learned gesture. Similar with voice commands, they could be as simple as start program, close program, next, or could be, when you think about those new things, chat GPT and so on, that it could under, try to understand what you were saying anyways, transcribe that and analyze it. Controllers still play a role, um, even so we have hand tracking because with controllers you get often a higher precision because you have those, you can have additional markers or positioning tools or it's something that enables you to, for example, have more precise movement in three-dimensional space or to translate your movements into something larger. Like, let's say, the, like moving the joystick on the controller could translate to a millimeter movement or it could be a kilometer movement in a, on a map. Now, I want to mention spatial sound, um, which fortunately, as a developer, typically you do not need to do much with it, but you can say that an application, like an object, has spatial sound. If it would be a phone, a virtual phone, you could play a song and uh, then position it, and then it would render this audio for you with, with the right headset coming from the right position. Why does it matter? Um, often you want to attract attention to something that's happening, and so you, it helps you um, to detect what is relevant to, for user interaction. Of course, again, accessibility. Some people are hard of hearing. I don't hear well my left ear, so you may still need other ways, but it's still a powerful capability that adds to the spatial experience other than just the visuals. Now, world coordinates and spatial mapping, we will talk about them a little bit more in this talk, um, are A, to have a coordinate system that we all agree on, like let's say we would have the same app in the same metaverse, and it has spatial awareness, then you all would know what's the coordinate of this phone, yeah? And we would be able to talk about this and or exchange information. And spatial mapping would be the ability of your, you, you have probably seen those LiDAR apps on iPhones or other platforms, the ability to somehow reconstruct your real environment in some form, like a mesh or something like that. So the concepts, again, the rough metaverse concept would be like we have, which are similar to what you find in other spaces. As I, we will dive into world, space, and location a little bit more. Um, location is just where am I right now. The space would be I'm in this conference center in this room. The world, I'm in the real world and not like in Minecraft, for example. The presence would be, again, that I'm engaged with you, that I'm speaking, that I'm online. Think of it like in Teams or in Skype, where it's just online status or busy or something. Presence would be a little bit more how can you be reached and how you can interact. And then representation. As I mentioned, digital twin is a way to think of it, but it could be also just any type of metadata, or for human beings, 3D models, avatars, how are we represented, has some positive effects. An avatar could, could be empowering for somebody to be able to represent themselves how they want to be represented, or sometimes it's all, also just a way to be more memory efficient in expressing um, like your 3D interaction, yeah, so because a, a 3D video stream is still difficult to do. Now, cross-world interoperability has not been solved yet, but it's one of the tenets that, tenets that you will need to follow for, let's say, good metaverse. And then you see state, persistence, synchronization, communication, interaction, network, and audio. You, this is, those are problems as multiple online playing games, like, um, uh, like uh, MM, MM or uh, geez, yeah, role playing games, and so try to solve for a long time. So you find a big overlap of the metaverse sphere, also with uh, traditional game development and so on. Now, what about blockchain and crypto? If you put metaverse in your LinkedIn profile, you get uh, quite some people reaching out 
who want to maybe sell you the next NFT, you might be an investor, or you may want to work on something or consider the services related to blockchain and crypto. And for some reason, Metaverse has been attached uh, through maybe being extension of Web3 in some people's view that it needs blockchain and crypto. I am skeptical. Blockchain and crypto can play a role. For example, um, NFTs, NFTs, non-fungible token, could be used to show ownership of a virtual asset that you then could use to move from one metaverse um, implementation at, say, Facebook's and then Meta's and then go to Microsoft's and then show you that you have that Dylan Beatty's cowboy hat in metaverse. Yeah? So that where it may play, play a role. And the idea, the promise behind that is that we have a concept of decentralization. Do we need decentralization? That I think the industry has not yet decided on it, but in the, in the hype cycle, you always have like centralization, decentralization, centralization, decentralization. It always alternates. And currently, people think that we need decentralization. And then the concept of coins, how do we pay for all this in a virtual currency? So in that Ignite keynote 2021, Microsoft Mesh was announced, and it was this bunch of capabilities and visions and apps on top of it with the Mesh SDK with um, core platform and so on. Unfortunately, it's a unicorn, and things have changed meanwhile. So we still have a lot of it. But core platform is, is basically what you have in Azure anyways, what you need to do to build any type of online application anyways. So those capabilities like audio, video, you have those fundamental capabilities or login, Active Directory, you have those in most cloud platforms. And then you have like more 3D-like capabilities. Um, like multi-users think uh, we don't have anything for that yet, but regarding holographic rendering, spatial maps, and immersive presence, we have a few things. I'll talk about a few of them. What we do not have is the SDK and the UX toolkit as they tried to implement it internally, I guess. They didn't succeed, and this didn't move on. Last week, a lot of the teams at Microsoft, unfortunately, um, were told they need to find uh, new avenues. What we do have is avatars. avatars has two components, um, and let me play that a video. This is basically what is, uh, some people already have available in Teams. You can represent yourself in Microsoft Teams as an avatar that you can design and um, have some interactions with that. The promise is that um, you have a bad hair day, you're tired, you don't want to show your face, but still engage, or to be able to interact in, let's say, uh, an actual virtual meeting, in a virtual space. Microsoft will come out with virtual immersive meetings that, um, where you can spin up a meeting room and enable both a two-dimensional experience and a three-dimensional experience. So you will be able to join there even if you don't have a 3D device and be, to be able to interact. I haven't seen that part. And those graphics here are from the World Economic Forum from last week, I think, yeah, where Microsoft um, is working with Accenture to prototype some new ways of collaboration and so on. Those things are coming, but Microsoft Mesh near term is basically avatars, immersive meetings, and then maybe customization of those meeting rooms. Meta um, does similar things uh, with Horizon workrooms and so on, and they already announced a collaboration already. For example, that avatars will be made compatible. That's one of the big problems. Like if everybody builds their own metaverse and I build avatars and they have I don't know, I have, um, I have finger joints, the other ones don't, and, or, or I have legs and the other ones don't. Right now, legs is a thing that is not implemented for a lot of them, as you see. Um, then you, don't, you have structural incompatibilities yet. And besides of how do you actually render the technology part of it. Now, um, this is what's coming. And organization-wise, uh, for those nerds who are interested, before, um, mixed reality metaverse was under, under Alex Kipman, who invented HoloLens and Kinect and so on. Alex Kipman left Microsoft last year, and then a part of it went to Jeff Tieper, who owns Teams and comes from a SharePoint background, so all the, the software capabilities, and uh, went there, and the hardware capabilities under, uh, under Panos Panay. And those, there's sources for that. I don't have them in, in my slide, so it's, it's not secret information. And um, so that also gives you an idea where they're headed and why are they headed this way. Well, one of the things is like you have all those great devices, and, but who uses them? So by giving it to Jeff Tieper, my interpretation is who has teams that they have, want to 
um, expose all the millions of Teams users to be able to have an easy in into Metaverse, even so it is less fancy as it was hoped earlier. So again, this is another view of the Microsoft Mesh capabilities, um, what they try to solve, it's like for example, um, yeah, um, spatial maps and so on. Let's, but let's try to move on to some specific examples. What is spatial understanding? Yeah, spatial understanding, um, in this talk, we'll not have a cloud context, but it's the idea when we are in a 3D environment, what are things we can relatively easily do or do differently to interact with it? One is we think about reasoning or interacting with a concept of location, like permanent location, which is often called anchor. Like the anchor is we're anchoring something and like a boat or ship, and um, then movement on that. Like so we can, we can store movement and analyze movement. If I wear a headset and I run fast, then I can calculate the velocity, the acceleration. And I could maybe even make, um, if I wear any type of spatially equipment, I could reason about um, ergonomics. Is it unhealthy? Is it somebody like crouched all the time and so on? So you could expose something like that. Or you could build something like what I said, like build a heat map. Or if you remember the kangaroo, this is like, like in the handle of Gretel, a fairy tale, like it follows the breadcrumbs you leave behind. So that's another way how you can build applications that feel somewhat natural to where an avatar, something artificial follows you. And then this whole topic of anchors, setting anchors and sharing anchors, which we have a separate uh, section in, in this talk. And then working what I call work the mesh. Um, what is the mesh? Um, we'll get more clear in the in a next slide. But it's basically how a computer typically represents this three-dimensional environment internally. You have some questions to solve. How can you optimize it because it's sensor data initially? How can you simplify it, make a plane equation? How do you find the wall um, that you may be able to put a virtual picture or your presentation on? Find the floor to, so you can walk on it and don't fall to your desk in the virtual environment or find any type of free space, let's say, on a table. So mesh is just a bunch of triangles describing a ge geometry, and it's based, let's say, for example, the HoloLens approximates what the depth camera has seen. Yeah, and you don't have much control over it other than describing to updates. Making a plane as an example, and I will try to make those slides available later, so um, I'm just trying to, so if I don't get into any detail of the words there, apologies, but we have a lot of ground to cover. So there are different approaches to how you can make a plane equation. For math, you need three points. So you could just say, uh, with like, let's say the virtual laser pointer. Oops, is it on? Oops, I'm advancing. Okay, I pressed the wrong button. Yeah, I'm pointing at the screen for those who follow it online. Um, so one position, two position, three position, and then you can define a plane equation through that. Or you can have more measurement points and average over them or do some more advanced analytics to do that and use AI. So there, so there are some advanced ways how you can try to do that for making a plane equation. Spatial understanding and scene understanding takes us a little bit further. Um, and those terminologies here, I borrowed them from Microsoft, is trying to identify what is a wall, what is a, a specific type of object like a chair, what is the surface we can interact on, and so on. So it gets probably more clear through examples, but how is it done roughly? Either through mass, like a lot of mass, like surface normals and whatnot, or sometimes logic built in into silicon, some AI that you maybe used, pre-turned AI. And um, the latest approach, for example, on HoloLens 2, they have uh, an, a runtime that's called scene understanding that enables some scenarios. Let's, Let's start with spatial understanding. I'm, don't try to read the text. Just to give you an idea, like this is available as a um, library. You can download in C++. So they have some concepts here. Find largest position suitable um, as one example. And they have one. They define here a construct, which is called um, a, ch a chair. Is it a chair? I think so. Um, and they, they say basically here, they define mathematically, like, OK, it has a specific surface height, 0.25. 25 meters to um, 0 0.6 meters has one surface and um, then a specific minimal area, geez, it's very sensitive here, is rectangular and um, all those other things, by the way, it's, it's not part of a couch. 
because you may have similar objects. So they define some types of query language to work on three-dimensional structures, and they build then before a lot of metadata up by analyzing um, what they need to do. For example, here they calculate normal vectors and um, defining all types, do all type of logic on what they have been scan what they have been scanning. It gets more clear when I show you a little video of how it looks like. Scene understanding is not as granular and you cannot influence it because this, the first thing is available as source code. You could modify it if you like C++. Um, and you can also use it in your own applications. In Unity 3D, you can use it, for example, there. Scene understanding is based, uh, baked in into HoloLens 2 and has more simple concepts. There's a wall, there's a floor, a ceiling, a platform, and a world. And we basically, the application has said, I want to do scene understanding. Please, runtime, give me updates. And then you consume those updates. Let's have a quick look how it looks like. And I was, um, so th this is kind of sped up. Um, so this, often you need to start scanning an environment. So when you're in an environment, you would walk around initially, and the, the device needs to start learning what the environment looks like. So and it will build out a, a mesh of that environment. You see it tries to fill in those blanks and what it has been scanned, and it already does some processing. So those surfaces are actually relatively normalized, relatively equal distance for all those little triangles. This is already a clean up step compared to the raw data. And um, yeah, skipping forward, and let's say we have scanned everything. That took like eight to 10 minutes almost to scan it, but then you don't need to do it again. And then in this example application, you can ask questions. For example, one of the questions you can ask is, find me um, a suitable area. And I, I feel like I need to click, but it's a video, I know. So that um, then actually is able to mark in, in this three-dimensional space what are chairs you could sit on. So now if you have an avatar, you could make that avatar sit there. Another query might be find, put something on the corners of some surface, like a coffee cup or a placemat or something. So a different type of query. And to complete it, um, let's say, uh, find things that are between ceiling and, um, and, and the, the top surface. And then here is, let's say, like a, a lot of free spaces we could use to place which objects. Let's jump, let me jump to the end here and find the largest wall for your video um, experience to, to show a movie or something like that. So this is how roughly you could interact with an application like that. And now let's, and the other one would be the spatial scene understanding, which is more simplified, but it starts really fast. So when an application starts, you get very fast, like a rough understanding of the main surfaces, like here's a background, Here's, um, here's a platform, so the platform you could place something, for example. The advantage being it's just very fast. Now, for both technologies, if you scan your environment and you have a mesh of it, you could basically have a dollhouse or a 3D representation of it that you could look at from a vantage point that's different. So let's say you scan a larger event space, you could basically use that as a base for a control center, let's say for an event space like this, and say which speakers, where's somebody in, um, other, it's a network op or then integrate into that from an IoT perspective. But in this case, it's just a very a simple demo application. Uh, do I have the second part of the demo? Yeah, so what you can also do is um, you can, like in a game, for example, or in a, or in a simulation, you can use physics, meaning you, you say, hey, in a game engine, you just say this object has gravity and Please, scanned environment behave like a real environment so, it, so those virtual objects then could fall off or roll off or be positioned on surfaces. Yeah? As a software developer, you don't need to do much if you're using a 3, like a 3D engine like Unity 3D, for example, or Unreal or Babylon JS in, in, in the JavaScript world. Um, existing cloud capabilities. So what can we do in the cloud? For example, one of the challenges is like when you have a headset like Oculus Quest 2 or HoloLens or even a cell phone, they are limited in what you can render on the device. And for example, let's say you have a big CAD model, CAD model, do you want to display that? CAD models are defined often in splines and NURBS. And uh, 3D hardware typically works on triangles and points, so you need to translate that. And the big CAD model can easily be 15 million, 30 million, and so 
uh, triangles, while a device starts to struggle when you have 200,000 of those. So they have a technology where they can render in Azure, basically pre-render that on really powerful hardware and stream it to your device. The streaming of those Azure, of Azure remote rendering is actually done per object, um, and without going into the details, you, you basically prepare the environment, prepare it, upload it to the cloud, pre-process it, then the rendering engine will be installed, and assuming your app is, um, is configured to do it, then it can consume um, those, this streaming from that instance in the cloud. It's not as exactly cheap, but it's in demand, let's say, for example, manufacture, uh, car companies who want to see how shiny something is, or uh, a company that's working on, on um, LiDAR scans of in buildings to visualize something like that. Let me try to show you an example video. What I mean by remote rendering. And I will skip around a little bit, just as you see. So this is like basically, this is the Microsoft Mesh app on HoloLens 2. It has a remote rendering functionality that you even can use for free. So you can upload something in OneDrive and you don't need to pay for the cloud resources to experiment with that, assuming you have HoloLens 2. Um, two. And let's say we're, so let's try it, downloading the model. So this is a car engine, for example. You see two things. As I'm interacting with it, there's a delay, how my controls translate. But this is more the, the, the manipulation con commands I give it. But from a, the perspective of the viewer, they are pretty good in keeping things accurate to my position, even though it's streaming. They do some advanced tricks, basically recalculating, they're predicting the next position you may have, and then basically patch it by some um, transformation if it doesn't align the next position that you would have. Like those um, graphics, even though they may not sound impressive, um, they look impressive, they're actually really difficult to display. Let's say this is a scan in the background of millions and millions of points of a re from a professional LiDAR scanner downloaded from web from website, and you can display that with ease, let's say, on, on a device like HoloLens. So this is one of the cloud technologies, and different vendors have different approaches that is relevant for more advanced, let's say, metaverse applications when you when your capabilities exceed on the device, what you could otherwise do. Azure Object Anchors, I cannot demo, because to demo that, I would need to have a large object, um, like a meter, square meter with me. Um, the idea is, um, as I said earlier, anchors are important, the ability to agree on a coordinate system. Like in this example, if you would drive the, a car into a repair shop, it's every time it's slightly different. A yeah, little bit left, a little bit right, doesn't have a barcode, where you can say exactly where it is, but you may want to align the instructions, how is the repair instructions, how is the wiring supposed to be done, how to disassemble something in specific order. And for that purpose, they developed this object, object anchor, anchor technology where you, again, upload an idealized model of that car to the cloud, then it gets pre-processed, and then your application is able to um, understand where, when you encounter that real object, where it is. And then now the spatial anchors. So spatial anchors are the concept, again, how do we agree on what we see? Um, there are some caveats with that. With that. Let's say you would, we would do a spatial anchor session together, and unfortunately we can't right now. Um, let's say I scan it on my phone, and someone of you had, would have a HoloLens 2 or another phone, and I would, if I would scan it from here, I would get some level of internal representation and I will give you an example of how that looks like. For example, so points like this, maybe how the system internally sees that environment and able to locate it. So it's very simplified. You cannot identify real people in that and they, I think in the cloud they even abstract it even, even more. Um, but it enables, let's say, a computer vision system to say, oh, this is where I am, yeah? by cross-referencing all the points. What is necessary is usually some type of agreement that we find, and that means we need to have seen things from a similar perspective. If I start scanning here and never scan standing at the entrance, then, and you would do the opposite and only scan from the entrance and never walk over here, then probably our perspectives would never find an agreement, but if we, at any point in time, 
uh, have been in a similar space. Let's say I scan from here and you also were here earlier. Then those point clouds, your point cloud and my cloud point cloud would have enough commonality that they could say where something is. Um, the concept from a software perspective. Again, this is a cloud service, and so the advantage of the cloud service is that it translates between what like HoloLens does, what Android does, and what iOS does, because all those have artificial uh, augmented reality systems, and all of them have their own way of locating something in, in, in real space, of fixing a coordinate. Um, they name it slightly different at times, but the idea here is we, as a, like we start a session, and the session is the anchor session, and then we provide frames to the session because it's all computer vision based. In HoloLens 2, um, HoloLens 2 has specific cameras, and there's a runtime that does it for you behind the scenes. You don't need to specifically provide those frames, but in general, basically, you provide a camera stream through some API, and the camera stream that gets analyzed, and then an anchor create, gets created, and the anchor, besides of internal information, like where it is, and it can have any type of properties, then, then um, through the session, you get relationship between anchors, like we have set that in the same session so you could find it easily, or you could have something called course location. I will have a separate slide on that. And then you can retrieve the anchors later uh, by identify relationship and course location. It sounds a little bit abstract, um, and let's quickly say course location, what it is, and how would it be used. Let's say, you stored some anchors somewhere, and now you want to load them, but how do you find them? The world is big. So course relocation basically narrows down where you search. Um, that could be GPS coordinate, and assuming you have GPS, or the location properties of your platform. It could be the Wi-Fi, the uh, MAC addresses basically of the Wi-Fi hotspot that a device sees, and then also maybe signal strength and so on, and um, observing that over time, or Bluetooth low energy beacons. A lot of event spaces, a lot of companies actually start putting Bluetooth energy beacons in their buildings to enable um, tracking or movement and um, rough uh, navigation capabilities. So it's basically a little sticker with a Bluetooth energy um, protocol support, similar to an AirTag and so on, uh, that um, can enable that. And together, this platform, this course relocation platform, can use all those different inputs to better find where it is. So if you come in this room and you would turn it on and let's say there is a Bluetooth energy beacon or a Wi-Fi and roughly we know the rough Wi-Fi coordinates, then it has a better chance of finding where it is because otherwise the database would be too big. I walk you briefly through like what it is and it's just similar to the other examples. How would you create something like that? Um, most of you probably have used Azure in some capacity. So um, I will read Think of it like a movie. You create a resource in, in Azure in whatever subscription it is, and you don't need to do much but when, other than deciding where it runs. And after you're done, you get, oops, where is it? After you're done, you, you get the, the, um, the key, basically, to access that resource um, and as a shared secret. Now, as a developer, and I didn't highlight, um, I didn't format it, um, correctly. So this is example code, and there's a lot of examples online would be how to use it from Unity CD, but the pattern is simple. It's like you create a session at the beginning, and then you have a, a switch here, a compiler switch. Like if you're on Android and iOS, then get the native platform pointer, which supplies the camera to the system. And if you're on Windows, um, then, um, so on, on HoloLens in this case, but that's the only platform supported, then um, it would use the internal system for that, and then provide the camera frames if needed to that runtime. And when you want to set an anchor, what you're dealing with is basically you, you need to combine working with the local coordinates, like those, um, the uh, local anchor information. I don't see my own mouse pointer, but it's relatively in the middle right now. The, you would basically correlate the local anchor information, which is mostly the coordinates in its coordinate system, with a concept called cloud anchor, then you may be able to set some properties and just save it. And save it to the cloud, and you get what you get back from the cloud is an identifier. You can also assign properties, any type of basically text or arbitrary data, and save it to the cloud. 
and also update those properties independently of actually interacting with the anchor on a device. So you could have backend code that um, goes through all your anchors and updates the properties you store there. Now, when you want to locate anchors, again, when you find them, um, you need to ask the system, give me the anchors. And if you start from scratch, you give it a bunch of IDs, and hopefully you remember the IDs that you got back when you stored it. That's one way. And then you get, tell the system, give me those anchors. And it basically will try to look for them and throw events back to an event handler. Either it has located the anchor, then you don't need, uh, then you can use that anchor in your code and get the right coordinates. And so we can agree on where this glass of water, for example, stands. Or, it, hey, dummy, it's already tracked. Why are you asking me again? That could be the other example. Or, like, oh, this anchor, this ID doesn't exist. And the most tricky part is the not located. Let's say that was an example. I would store an anchor from here, and somebody would call it, try to retrieve it from the entrance of this room, and we never have been in a similar location. Then um, the person at the entrance probably would not um, be able to get that anchor, and after a while get this exception. Um, well, it's not really an exception, but this status that it has not been located. Then you can retry or provide some information to the user. Just a little video of how would that look like in an example application. So this is just demonstrating it um, um, a little bit sped up. You would set an anchor on an Android device here, and then store it to the cloud. Um, before that it does that, it captures some data, um, visual data to correlate it, stores it in the cloud, and then you try to re retrieve it again, and it finds it luckily in the same position. And then now I put do the same thing on HoloLens. I store an object as a spatial anchor, want to retrieve it, and um, ideally it would show the previous anchor and the new anchor that I just put. Um, so yeah, it found two anchors there, and if you advance that a little bit further, okay, let's put one a little bit further away to make it more real then it should be able to retrieve all of them. So the power of this is really to be able to work cross-platform and cross-user sessions. And now I skipped in my... Ah, okay. Jesus Christ. I... Where was I? Okay, I need to press the right combination, my function key, um, control F5. Huh? Yeah, okay. So um, I promised in, in, in my abstract that I also would mention Connect. Um, I will only do it briefly. So Connect, Azure, Azure Connect is the next iteration of the depth sensing camera that you may have known from Xbox and so on. And the interesting part of it is that this device is still around and um, has a different role, let's say, in the metaverse as something that is enabling depth perception. Like for example, seeing people in three-dimensional space without them wearing a headset. And why do I start with this slide? Because um, Microsoft pivoted around, I think, um, one and a half years ago and opened up their intellectual property, and there's a bunch of companies building their own depth cameras based on the intellectual property of Microsoft. So um, at CES, some of them announced new things, so there's more coming. Um, even so, Kinect sometimes has been talked about as a swan song situation. Um, just briefly, what Kinect is, it's a depth camera here, which, which a time of flight depth camera, based on infrared um, laser type of light, modulated laser light, light combined with an RGB camera and a bunch of other things like a sound, uh, like a sound field capable mic microphone array, which those vendors probably will not integrate, and some uh, logic components that make it easy to synchronize the streams from multiple cameras. What you can do with it is here have basically have the depth map of an environment, have an infrared um, picture of the environment that's completely oblivious of other light sources. So if I would shine a flashlight on that, you wouldn't see the flashlight. You would, it would only be able to see the light that itself sent out because it modulates the light. 
So, and what you can do more advanced with it, basically you can analyze human motion and um, joint positions and so on. I know there are other cameras and other systems and apps and 3D and AI models that can do similar things, but it has a very good fidelity if you would want to build an interactive application that tries to understand where humans are, how they move, how fast they move. For example, in, in, in the industry, sometimes you want to avoid that a human is a specific area next to a machine, or you need to do the opposite, or do you do the opposite, you only start the machine if the people are standing in a safe zone or something like that. Yeah, so a lot of use cases for that. The interesting thing is, um, uh, from a technology perspective, that those new waves of um, understanding human people is, is also built basically on top of avatars. What they built is so-called synthetics. They know exactly the every position of the synthetics, meaning that they don't need to put markers on real people, and they don't need to create a lot of training videos. They can simulate all of that, then transform what they calculating into that on the lower left side, the the visual rendering would be like a Kinect camera would see it, and then they train the AI model based on what the Kinect would see, so when they then later on run it, they can reason on that. Um, what it enables them then is to accommodate for a lot more human diversity, different body types, skin types, abilities, disabilities, and different um, um, uh, multiple um, different environments, not just a living room like in Kinect for Xbox, but let's say doctor's office, uh, factory floor, and whatnot. Now, let's jump now towards the end of the talk. Um, to, like, if you want to get started as a developer, like, what are my options? Yeah. If I wanted to get started as a developer, you deal suddenly with 3D stuff. With, um, you could get, you could be core to the, to the guts, to the roots, and let's say develop C++ with DirectX, or use the Unreal Engine that's also using C++. Um, you could use C Sharp and work with Xamarin, which has also some 3D functionalities and people who are building libraries for that. Um, Unity 3D is a very popular engine. Um, most of actually most of virtual reality development in the industrial world is done in Unity 3D because it's um, just relatively easy to adopt for, for .NET developers. And then you have open source projects like StereoKit, and um, then there's um, another project called Uro Sharp. Not sure if it's still being maintained. Um, what you see in general is uh, a lot of game engines and tools being used because they solve problems for you. For example, they solve the problem: what is an avatar? What? How do you define human motion? They have models for that to speed that up. They have a physics engine built in. Again, like you have a you define a three-dimensional ball and you just drop the virtual ball and it will behave naturally as that engine clicks in, and it's gonna be accelerated depending on what your hardware can do. Like if you have a hardware that can calculate physics for you, it may do it for you automatically. If not, it runs on the CPU. And then the, and another interesting space in this whole web XR field. As this, those technologies mature, and on the metaverse side, they're still relatively early in it. Um, it's the Kronos group that's dealing with it mostly, um, who was also working on OpenXR. Um, you find some standardization and virtual reality capabilities able, enabled in a lot of web browsers. So you could use uh, JavaScript to build mixed reality, virtual reality applications. Some notable frameworks or approaches are Babylon.js, 3.js, or A-Frame um, as, as just starting points. And actually, Babylon.js um, has a, you can just Google for it. There's a playground you can just play around with and say, um, start creating or exploring online games, for example. I know that's, that's on purpose very high level here, but I want to show something. Um, and, and, and then on the Unity world, one of the most popular frameworks, especially in the mixed reality field, is, is the mixed reality toolkit number three, which is uh, not a version number, but more like a architecture, like the third iteration of the architecture. Now there's a big of a bummer. Microsoft last year let that complete, complete team go. Yeah, they, but it's by, by far the most adopted platform to build applications for mixed reality, metaverse, and so on, including internally in Microsoft. And they're building on top of OpenXR. So 
So that's uh, with that, they can, we can relatively target different devices, not just um, HoloLens, but you can write a Oculus Quest, a Meta Quest 2 application with relatively minimal changes. And they have also other plugins uh, for, I think, ARKit and so on to start enabling this. Like, so you work in Unity, then use MTK, and um, then um, hopefully have an easy migration story. It has a bunch of advanced features, like concepts like what is a button, what is a slider in 3D, and all those things that are really expensive and difficult to build. Um, why do I still mention it? Because everything is open source, so hopefully and there are some signals that it may happen that, um, that hopefully there will be people maintaining it going forward. Maybe somebody will swoop in and, and invest into it because it's, it's really valuable to have this framework. And then really, really finally, um, I wanted to show something which is, um, if you have enough time, I can also try to do it live. But there's, so Babylon JS I mentioned before is, is JavaScript and there's a, there's a playground. Let's, let's just open the playground really quickly. Playground.babylon.js. Yeah, so basically, um, it's um, code on the left side that you can experiment with, that you can learn, start learning, and then you can say here, let's just move it a little bit, 1.5. Oh, that's a light story. Uh, when you are, and run this. So and I made it bigger by a little code change. So you can interactively explore and basically dive into this engine. Now the, the cool last part is, um, and that's interesting because like one of the questions you get like, okay, does it like need three D experts and people to work with that? Now. What I'm, what I'm starting up here is a little uh, thing that Microsoft built combining basically GitHub, um, and sorry, OpenAI's codex with Babylon.js. You could do something like create sphere. Like put cube next to sphere. Yeah. Rotate cube around sphere. And behind the scenes, it basically, it's similar to the playground uh, the technology, and it, it does some things with that. So, and make cube red on mouse over um, sphere becomes blue, and then turns back, um, turns, uh, Green when you leave. That's a, I didn't try that one. That's um, life risk. It's a relatively complicated command. Let's see if, it, if I get something back. Uh, ah, see, it worked. So this, I think, is, and I, I don't see it as a mic drop moment, but this can give you an idea how in the future also you may be able you to interact with three-dimensional worlds different, how you can author logic differently if you combine those large AI models that are also a big mega trend with, let's say, an in, in, in interactive canvas how you can develop software. Yeah? Unity 3D, Unreal and so on is more baked in, pre-baked, and you, you cannot modify it on the fly. But the JavaScript frameworks, I have a lot of hope there that, it, with, that will enable a new way of even defining metaverse-like in, worlds in the future and, and, and unlock it for more people. Again, this is extremely simple, cube and sphere, but I think you can see the potential that's coming out of that. With that, I think I'm at almost at time. Um, I will be available to chat, and this is an example I pre-recorded um, in case it doesn't work, um, around it and um, open it up for questions and answers. If, I, if people kick me out, I think we have lunch. I'm, I'm available, so thank you.